Hello and welcome to another episode of Justin. And D- this is one take, man. We're not we're not hitting stop and we're doing this. This is uh, episode three of Justin and Donald Save America. How is it going, everybody? Uh, we're going to be talking about a couple of things today, but the the main gist of it is going to be what's really happening at cop 26 but before we get into any of these topics or anything like that uh well first off i guess i'll introduce myself as always i'm your host donald kendall joined by justin haskins how's it going justin uh it's going great awesome all right and uh as as you should know this is a very brand new show like i said episode three of justin and donald save america so we're just getting started so anything that you guys can do uh anything that you do will help us out get us in front of more people Hitting the like button, hitting the share button, even leaving a comment will uh, do wonders of getting us to break through that algorithm and appear on more people's feeds and all of that. So whatever you can do to help out this content, if you like our show, would be greatly appreciated and will have great effects for us. But uh, Justin, so we thought, you know, let's do an episode on COP26. It's happening right now in Scotland, right? This would be a a good fodder for this episode. In Glasgow. Glasgow, Scotland, because this is like a, you know, there's like the surface level stuff. Let's all go down there. All the world elites go down there. We'll talk about climate change and we'll virtue signal and all of this stuff. Maybe we'll get to meet Leonardo DiCaprio. Any number of wonderful things could happen in Glasgow. Um, But there's also kind of an underlying thing, like the the real meat of why all of these elites are there and and what they can actually accomplish. So I think that's going to be a good... uh, a good good topic to really dive into right yeah yeah so the, the the most important thing to keep in mind about these climate conferences because i think a lot of people when the when these climate conferences happen they think to themselves you know haven't we had like a million of these <laughs> it, it, w- w- does anything ever actually come out of these meetings and the tr- the truth is that the answer is no if you're looking at it the wrong way If you're looking at it the wrong way, and most people look at it the wrong way, they look at the actual frameworks that are produced by the governments. And when, and that's what gets all the headlines. Okay. The most famous example of that was cop 21. I don't know what the other several cops since 21 and 26 have produced, but cop 21 was the Paris climate agreement cop. Okay. That happened in Paris. That was 2015, the Obama administration. Everyone's going crazy over, uh, you know, climate change and everything. And they produced the Paris climate accords. Now these frameworks get lots of attention, but they don't actually have any teeth behind them. And so none of it is enforceable. Right. And so everybody just basically blows them off. They, they, they use it as a way of virtue signaling all these government yeah. officials. And that's exactly what the Paris Climate Agreement ultimately ended up being. Basically, nobody followed uh, the commitments that they made way back in 2015. Nobody. Basically, nobody. Yeah. So they make these commitments and then they don't actually do anything. But what does happen is all of these meetings occur on the side between big players in 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 uh, government and the bureauc the bu- like the administrative state the swamp as Trump would say um, and, and uh, banks and financial institutions and investors and all these kinds of people actually do get things done but it's a different sort of thing so in a lot of ways I think that the government stuff you know the big government frameworks the Paris Climate Agreement the Glasgow Agreement which inevitably will come about. Uh, those are pointless Hmm. but the rest of it i think does matter and that's the stuff that i'm interested in that's the stuff that i'm paying close attention to yeah no no doubt and and i remember when the climate paris treaty awards whatever it was called i remember that like our uh, like the heartland people right uh it was all like, yeah, there's no teeth here. Like they they signed this thing, but it's all just for when show. He, and... When Donnie says the Heartland people, he means the Heartland Institute where he and I work. In case, yeah, in more, case you more, didn't know that. More broadly, I just yeah. mean like the anti-climate change right. alarmists. The conservative, right? the conservatives, you know, the non-alarmist conservative types. That's yes. right. Yeah. Yeah. This this thing's got no teeth. It, it's just for it's just for show, uh, you know, but it's it, it, they almost like declared victory on the fact that it wasn't like a uh you know holding people's feet to the fire and making sure that they well 
yeah go ahead sorry well uh, you know so that that's it again and that's just kind of the surface level thing and yeah. then what's even worse than that because like even that has some substance you know we're actually kind of going through what this plan is what it entails any type of punishment type things in there and being like yeah there's it's all for show there's nothing here so at least there's some substance there but like the mainstream media portrayal of all of this, uh, well, you've got you've got two sides of it. You've got the left side, which is the majority of the mainstream media, which is just like, oh yeah, look at all this important work they're doing, and they're just trying to champion, you know, the Greta Thunbergs and the Leonardo DiCaprios that are going down there, and the the Al Gores and all the important messaging that they're doing. But then on the right side of the aisle, like the Fox News is and all of that they're more focused on like the hypocrisy of them flying jets and like the elites, like staying up in posh hotels and all of that. And like that to me is like even worse than surface level. Like I get it. I understand just kind of the clickbaity headline title of that uh, supposed hypocrisy. Right. Is that, is that something that kind of annoys you when that's like the main takeaway from people on the right when it comes to these meetings? Well, I mean, I will say this, they're, they're, I do agree with you that many people on the right focus on the hypocrisy element to all of this. And of course there is a gigantic hypocrisy, you know, piece to this. Uh, and I, I understand what you mean and I agree with it mostly, but I will say that there is value in pointing out that these people are hypocrites because it illustrates that I think it at least it illustrates that these people don't actually believe any of this. Well, that's true. And and because if they did, then they wouldn't. You know, I saw this thing the other day. You know, there's a million stories about the hypocrisy thing. I was in fact I was watching Fox News this morning, and they had a story. They had a, they had pictures of all the private jets that yeah. have, flew in, right? But I saw this one thing, and I can't remember where it was, and I don't know how accurate it is. But I do know that there are tons and tons and tons of staff to for the uh for like the world leaders who are going there and the one figure that i heard reported today was twenty thousand staff members yeah according to this article twenty five thousand delegates there and tens of thousands who want to attend the cop 25. Right. so so you're talking about you're talking about all these people flying to glasgow i mean last i checked we have the internet we have cameras. You and I we're live all been doing Zoom bro. like 800 miles away from each other. And we're recording this video and having this conversation right now. Do we really need to have like 50,000 people fly to Glasgow, you know, for all of this? What's this? What's the carbon footprint of that? I mean, I understand the, the, the hypocrisy argument is very surface level and it's very easy to make. And I get it, you know. But at the same time, it does prove if you really did truly believe that this was a crisis, we're all going to die from it. And there are a lot of people who believe that, as we'll show a little bit later, uh, including one talking dinosaur, um, <laughs> which is a real thing. You'll see. But but th that's like that's kind of the point, right? If you really did believe that, if you really did believe we're all about to die, then you wouldn't be you wouldn't be flying anywhere. Well, I, I guess that's you know? true. I guess that's true. I mean, they so talk there's a, there's there's some value to that is what I'm saying. Sure. Yeah, I'm like looking through like some of these articles because I'm just curious. Like, well, first off, look at this picture of Greta. <laughs> she's got a mask wrapped around the microphone. That she's that she's talking <laughs> into. <laughs> this is just absurd levels <laughs> of stuff here. But yeah, so like you know whether it's the Davos <laughs> meeting, <laughs> I've never seen that before. I literally just noticed that. I've never seen that ever. <laughs> Like for anyone, that's the first time I've ever seen that. Why don't they just wrap the whole thing in a big mask? Can they do that? Why doesn't she just wrap herself in a mask like a yeah. mummy and then everyone will be safe from her? Right. So all of these people are going. I'm just looking at this article. So like, uh, what, what's it like, you know, to be in one of these giant international meetings? Like I said, there's the Davos one. There's these COP20 yeah. whatever meetings that are happening. And it talks about all the security that's needed, all the hotels that are needed. It even mentions at one point yeah. that Estonia is sending luxury cruise ships to basically hold overflow of people that can't find rooms in these hotels. Hmm. The amount of yeah, the amount of security that's needed. I was looking at this one article here that uh, was talking about the different hotels that they could stay at, and uh, you know it's like the 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 Devonshire Gardens. It says the boutique hotel boasts a cigar shack, 
whiskey room, wine cellar, and each of the 49 bedrooms comes with plasma screen as well as Egyptian cotton sheets and monsoon shower heads. So, oh, wow. you know, when these people are going to Glasgow to save the world, they're going to be putting themselves up in the most luxurious of hotel rooms and surely dining on the best food that Glasgow's got to offer. But, you know, they're, it's it's for a purpose, man. They're trying to save the world. How dare you focus on this? But but I understand it. You know, you can you could look at it, the hypocrisy and the idea that's just like, you know, do they really think the the, the world is ending? If, if they really thought that the carbon footprint was such a thing that they need to deal with, um, why isn't like, why aren't they like carpooling there? You know, like I heard that Joe Biden took the Air Force One over. John Kerry you know, took his own private jet. You know, I'm sure there's like 50 other people from the United States alone. You hear Jamie Pritzker, the governor from Illinois, is going down there. What he's is wa- he going to contribute? He's waddling over there. I didn't know. <laughs> what is he going to contribute I, to all of this? It's ridiculous. It, it, of course it's ridiculous. Of course it is. And that's kind of the point, right? Is And that, and it's so... But this is the thing. This is the thing. It is ridiculous. There is hypocrisy. It does have some value to point it out. At the same time, because it is the easiest argument to make that it's like, oh, if the world was really ending, all these people wouldn't be acting this way. So guess what? The world is probably not really ending, right? And so it's like the easiest way to win some people over. But at the same time, it's really important not to get too uh, focused on these things because there are important things that happen. And, and if you just dismiss it all as, oh yeah, like they're just going to, you know, to Glasgow or Paris or whatever, and who cares? It doesn't matter. Nothing ever comes out of these things. It's like, no, things do happen. It's just, they're not the things that the media reports about because that's not, the media on the left and the right is super, super focused on politics. It's all about politics and politicians as if Joe Biden going there is like actually matters when all these deals and everything that they come up with and at a political level, that's all been determined before anyone ever shows up in Glasgow. It's not like they show up in Glasgow and sit down and Joe Biden's in there negotiating line by line, some agreement, like give me a break. Like his staff did that a long time ago. There's already been an agreement. It's probably been in the works for, for years that they've been working on this or something. Right? So, the media loves to focus on the politics, but the politics is really not where things are happening anymore, especially in the United States where you have gridlock. They can't even pass a infrastructure bill in the United States. So, I mean, the idea that the idea that politics is actually driving policy and changing the land, the world to a large extent really isn't that true anymore. Right. Yeah. Uh, it's it's I, I just think for like your average politician that's going down there, they probably have like a, f- I don't know, a one minute speech. It seems like there's like hundreds of these people down there. So it's like how much time do they really have to present or like do work? But, uh, you know, at the at the least uh, at the at the lowest end of it, they definitely get some rest and relaxation and i think our own president joe biden uh best exemplifies that (laughs) with this video that was kind of trending along online uh where he's listening to uh a climate emergency (laughs) he's listening to a climate emergency uh presentation and he starts dozing off a little bit he does his eyes eyes are away okay yeah there they go it's nap time you know, it's, it's, look, I get it. I, I get it. You know, he's, he's tired. He's had a long, he's had a long day, right? It's probably like 10 a.m. Uh-huh. This is nap time for him, I'm sure. This is definitely nap. Somebody, def- somebody put that out. coffee in front of him. That sh- they were hoping that that, oh, and then they come over, uh, sir, um, you're napping. You gotta wake up. You're napping, you have sir. to wake up. This looks. This is very embarrassing. I'm yeah. gonna pretend to give you some type of uh, uh, update on what's going on, but it's just to basically poke you and wake you up. <laughs> I will. Okay, I will say this. As much as I, I like Joe Biden is a, is to me, uh, he's he's in a lot of ways from a policy perspective, he is as radical or more radical than like any president we've had in a long time. He's, he's worse than Obama in terms of policy. He really is. Um, oh, and, and he's, he's dumber than Obama in a lot of ways, but I can't take him seriously at all as like, even a villain, like he's the most, 
It's like, can you imagine watching like a James Bond movie or something and the villain is like napping in front of some really important speech or something? Like that's like, that's this guy. He, you know, the ice cream, yeah. the, he's forgetting like Shit. basic facts about his life, telling stories that are false that have been debunked like over and over and over again. It's just like, it, it's, he's such a, he in some ways is such a villain and in other ways he's like, like belongs in an old home or something, oh, yeah. you know? Yeah, 100%. I mean, it's just, it's, I don't know. I can't take, I just can't take him seriously. So, you know, along with uh, these, like the concept of a toothless proposal coming, resulting from this, this conference, uh, you sent an email to me. Uh, I was on it. You sent an email. It was outlining like, no, well, this is the thing that we really have to pay attention yeah. to. Like the kind of the, the under the, the stuff that's not going to get the media attention, the meetings that are kind of happening behind closed doors. So, Start start filling us in with this because to me this is like this is what we should be paying attention. This is what the Fox News is of the world, the Newsmaxes of the world should be talking about. Go for it. Right. So one of the biggest things that's happening right now in Glasgow is that there are meetings that are occurring uh, uh, within a, a variety of different groups, but the biggest one for me is this group called the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero. Okay. It's uh, G F A N Z G fans, okay, and you'll they use that acronym all the time, which is why I'm spelling it out. The Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero. Now, what is this group? This group is uh, it was put together by top people in uh, the financial industry internationally to, according to their own website, quote, to bring together the financial sector to accelerate the transition to a net zero economy, meaning net zero CO2 emissions, okay? And the purpose of GFANS is to do this, I know, it's just ludicrous names, <laughs> I know, is to do this by imposing uh, the Paris Climate Agreement and things like that, whatever they come up with at Glasgow, on the Western economy, and really they want to do it on the global economy, but they just don't have as much power in Asia as they do elsewhere. On the Western economy, using the financial sector, okay? So they want to try to, they want to, try to reshape the economy through the financial sector rather than through government. Now, by financial sector, what I mean is, I mean uh, not just banks, not just investment groups and Wall Street and things like that, but also uh, pension funds, um, I'm, uh, let's see, the, the, I, there's a list here that I have here. They've got the uh, Net Zero Banking Alliance. Those are the banks. The Net Zero Asset Managers, that's like pension funds and groups like that. Uh, or actually, no, that's like BlackRock and those kinds of people. Mm -hmm. Then you have Net Zero Asset Owner Alliance. I think those are the pension funds. The Paris Aligned Investment Initiative and Net Zero Insurance Alliance. So insurance companies, and that's a pretty big part of it. So basically, global finance in the West. Okay, how do we get, how do we get, the financial industry to all be on board towards uh, moving their economies toward this net zero economy, whether they want to do that or not, whether there are uh, government policies put in place or not that will actually impose it from uh, elected representatives or bureaucracies or things. How do we just do this through the banking system, through insurance? Well, we're going to do it by saying um, that we're just not going to do business with anybody who doesn't agree to adopt our view of battling climate change and environmentalism and adopting green energy and on and on and on. So for example, the Net Zero Banking Alliance, which is part of this larger group, has 84 banks globally in 36 countries. Together they control $64 trillion mm. in assets, trillion with a T, and each bank has pledged to, quote, transition all operational and attributable GHG, that's greenhouse gas, emissions from our lending and investment portfolios to align with pathways to net zero by mid-century or sooner, including CO2 emissions reaching net zero at the latest by 2050. Now, just don't gloss over this, it's important. They want to remove the operational and attributable greenhouse gas emissions from our lending and investment portfolios. Well, what that means is if you want to, if you want a bank account with one of these banks, as part of this alliance, then you better be green. If you're not, then you're out because that's, we can't have that in our portfolio. If you want to, if you want to, uh, your business and you want, um, a loan, 
you want any kind of financial services at all. Maybe you could even be an individual who buys a house and you buy a house and you, um, you know, uh, want a mortgage and the lender comes to you and says, well, you know, does the house have solar panels on it? Oh no, it doesn't. Well, we'll give you the loan, but you got to put solar panels on it and then we'll give you the loan or we'll give you the loan as a condition. You have to put solar panels on it within 60 days of getting it. Same thing could be true with insurance companies. Insurance company could come to you. I'm in the process right now of trying to buy a house and there's an insurance, the insurance company, uh, looked at the roof of the house. We're trying to buy really nice house, but the roof is, you know, old over 20 years old. They looked at the, they, they looked at the age of the roof and they said, we're not going to give you insurance with a roof that's over 20 years old. You have to, unless you agree to replace the roof hmm. within 60 days, okay? Well, what's to stop them from doing the exact same thing except with solar panels and windmills and stuff like that? Or maybe the windows aren't green enough or maybe whatever, you could just make it up. I mean, maybe there's not a uh, smart meter on the house. I don't know, it could be anything. Now, if I, and this is really important, the lender that I'm working with to get the mortgage has conditioned getting the mortgage on the insurance company agreeing to insure the home. So if I can't find an insurance company that will insure the home, I can't get the mortgage even if the lender doesn't care about green energy. Mm. So they get me, they can get you on both sides of this, right? And this is just someone buying a house. It could be anything like this. It could be any kind of business transaction, any kind of financial uh, transaction that you have to make in the world. I mean, really, when you think about it, can you exist in the world without a checking account, without, without a savings account? without, you know, access to credit cards? No, not really. Right. And yet all of those companies, there's only a handful of them, really. There's only a dozen or so really large companies that control the financial industry, really in the United States for consumers. And if they all get on board and they all say, we're only doing business with people who are battling climate change, that's it. And we're not gonna do it today. We're gonna give you a couple years, you know, does a transition to understand that this is your new responsibility, but, if you're not going green, then we're not doing business with you. You literally can't function. And so that is, I, that's the purpose of this alliance. And that's one of the things they're trying to hammer out the details of exactly how this would work. But all of these companies have already made commitments to do this. So this isn't a hypothetical. And not only that, but my understanding is based on some of the documents that I've found, they can't just say they're going to do it. They actually have to provide evidence that their uh, board of directors or that their CEO or someone like that has actually signed off on this and said, yes, this is an official policy of our company. So it has to actually have been a policy put into effect by the company in order to be part of this alliance. So they're trying to give it some, not teeth, but they're trying to make sure that these people aren't just saying they're going to do it and then not actually do it. This is how real change actually happens. It's through this kind of system. And this is all part of the Great Reset and the stuff we've talked about many times before. Yeah, no, I'm just looking at this press release here talking about the, uh, what is it, G-Fans? or G-Fans. <laughs> G-Fans. G-Fans. Uh, uh, it says here that the Net Zero Insurance Alliance, what you were just talking about, has submitted a statement of intent to join the UN Race to Zero and become part of G-Fans and is expected to officially be launched at cop 26 so this is the thing that is actually going down at cop 26 and and yeah you mentioned the great reset we dedicated the entirety of episode two of justin and donald save america to the great reset so that should serve as a a nice foundation for a lot of the stuff that we're going to talk about on this show to be built on top of and this is absolutely part of that i mean you're, you're talking about the insurance companies and some banks and them uh, potentially or already starting to condition their loans or, uh, you know, insuring something on these conditions that are talked about inside the Great Reset. And is that because they're going to find that it's, you know, beneficial to their bottom line? Uh, they're going to make more money off of doing stuff like this? Or is it because they are moving past the whole shareholder economy and going into stakeholder economy? Because that's what it seems like to me, Justin. How does it help them from a financial perspective? If exactly. there's nothing else going on behind the scenes, if there's no other agreements or deals or money being sent to them in some other fashion, and by that I mean 
through government programs, through central banks, printing money and giving it to the financial system. You know, if there's none of that going on and and it really is just all, whoa, we care about the environment. I mean, how is this good for their business? How mm-hmm. is it good for their employees? How is it good for their customers? How does it help them grow their business? It just, it doesn't unless they all, and that's the other part is it only works if they all do it. If, if just one company does this, then just everyone else, just consumers just avoid that company and they go someplace else, right? But if everyone does it, there's no place for you to escape. Yeah. Yeah. Well, not only that, but uh, like they're in these rooms with all these different government officials and all of this stuff. So what we have presumed, and we have some evidence that suggests this, and we kind of covered some of it in the Great Reset episode, is that, uh, you know, if this does start hurting their bottom line and all of that, well, they're going to be positioning themselves really nicely to get the next uh, government stimulus check or the next bailout or, uh, you know, some type of subsidy or or some type of condition passed to make sure that their line of business or what they're doing or pursuing is so important that we can't just let it fall by the wayside when we're talking about it from like a bureaucratic government perspective. So they're positioning themselves to be nice and friendly with all of the people that are uh, attending COP26 right now. Yeah. It's a It's a really horrifying <laughs> it's, a, it's right. kind of a it's a very ingenious kind yeah. of beautiful if you look at it from a uh you know a very anti-human perspective <laughs> yeah setup without, that they've got going on here without a doubt i mean there's an element of it that is very much driven by fear of government and especially regulations and stuff that's that's because, another good point the, because the i mean stick component of right the i mean the government the governments in europe we already know are trying to impose these kinds of policies esg scores and things like that to try to create a new system for evaluating companies to determine who the good guys are and who the bad guys are who the woke companies are they're the good guys and who aren't right and we know that in the united states they're starting to lay the framework for that the Securities and Exchange Commission here under Joe Biden is creating offices related to ESG. They're studying ESG. They're they're man. They're going to start mandating ESG disclosures um, from companies that are uh, that that produce ESG reports, which is just about everybody. So um, the big corporations they all have ESG reports just about. So I mean, we know this is all coming. We know that that's the groundwork that's being laid, and they know this too. So they want to be on the right side of history from their perspective, right? And the right side of history from their perspective is don't do anything that upsets the government regulators. And that's, that's, so that's definitely part of it. But the other part of it is, well, don't worry guys, because what's to stop them from all coming out and saying, all right, well, fine. If you guys are going to be jerks to us about this and make our lives miserable, we're going to have this big unified campaign against anyone in government that wants to support something like this. Why didn't the corporations go that route, right? The reason they didn't go that route is because they're also getting filthy rich off of it mm. through cronious schemes, government printing of money, all that stuff. And we talk about that again in the Great Reset video more at length. So if you wanna, if you wanna learn more about that, go watch that video because that's a great presentation of that. But there's they're getting it from both sides. There's a fear element, but there's also the carrot where they're gonna get super rich off of this kind of cronyism too. Uh, so. I've got a kind of an overarching question for you when it comes to all of this stuff. Um, a seemingly large contradiction that I see when we talk about these things. But before I get into that question, is there anything else that you want to talk about of just of, along the concept of what's really happening in COP26? Well, I, I think the, the, the last thing that I'll I'll add to that is that it's not just about the finance stuff. I mean, this is what we talked about. I think it's the most important thing. But there's also a bunch of other things that are like this, and we're just I'm just now starting to dig into some of the evidence uh, about those things. But there are other similar kinds of groups related to education, for example, youth activism. Uh, there's a gender there's a whole day that's supposedly going to be devoted to gender equity and climate change at this at the conference. I mean, these kinds of things, <laughs> What? <laughs> I, I don't know. I that's what it says on the schedule. I'm still trying to figure that one out. So the, the, the okay. point is, there's a lot of this stuff going on. And um, the, but the most the, the critical aspects of this event are all happening on the periphery. It's not the main events. It's not the main framework. It's not the debates and the stuff that's going on amongst the world leaders. And, you know, what is the specific amount of CO2 emissions that we're going to commit to? You know, I mean, it's 
that's not the case. The other thing that I want uh, people to keep in mind is that, you know, China, really, these conferences don't matter unless China goes along with it too. Because China emits more CO2 than anybody in the world. By far. By far. It's not even close. And they're building out more uh, coal and other things, uh, CO2 intensive aspects of their economy than everybody else by far. By far. <laughs> right. They literally are building more coal. He's not coal. going, by the way. Xi Jinping, he's not there. No, no. Actually, and Putin. Putin's not there either. No. And the reason why is because. They're probably the most honest people involved in this whole thing. <laughs> Which is sad. Ironically, <laughs> right. Because they the reason why is because they have no intention, really, of actually doing anything related to this. No, they are I... making out like bandits on CO2 related stuff. And they're not going to destroy their economies while the West is committing suicide. They're all for it. No, Let... they'll, go, they'll benefit from it. They they're... will. We, Absolutely. We, we have to do an episode in, in the next couple of episodes just based on energy. Yeah. Because there are some articles that I've been reading that are ridiculous when it comes yeah. to the energy situation in Europe and how it's playing directly into the hands of China oh, of and course. Russia. Of so course. so we, we sh probably shouldn't get into a whole lot no, of detail no. on this one because we could dedicate an entire hour to just yeah. talking about the situation going on in Europe. It's ridiculous. Without, without a doubt. But what, one last thing about China before we move on is it's just that the Chinese, that you're right, the, China, uh, uh, the president of China did not show up. He did, however, send a note and they read the note. <laughs> so that's good. And not only that, but he sent a, they're all mad at him because he didn't in the note commit to more extreme CO2 reductions. But he sent a list of commitments that had been kind of relative. They were relatively new. He sent a list of commitments, I guess, like last week saying, oh, yeah, we're going to do this stuff. And in the commitments, it says I'm not making I don't have it in front of me, but I'm not making it up. <laughs> it in, seems like a setup for a joke, but in the, it's not. It's not at all. In the commitments, it says that we plan their plan is that their CO2 emissions are going to peak, meaning they're going to be at their highest level ever in 2030 and then we'll start to reduce our co2 emissions All right so their plan is we're just gonna actually our co2 emissions are gonna keep going up and that's the plan but don't worry because in nine years i promise we'll start reducing them once we get to the new all-time highs and we're done building all these new coal-fired power plants that we're just putting together now dozens and dozens and dozens of them even though coal-fired power plants last a lot longer than nine years so i don't think they're gonna be shutting down these coal plants that they're building right now hmm. i mean uh, but think I've, about that That's... I've got, uh, so this this is purely speculation i i do not know okay but uh, I, I know that uh, when we talk about the reductions in like, you know, first world economies, the United States and Europe and all that, they always have it like it's got to be reduced by X percent of your 2015 levels or something. Right. It's like 2008 levels or they have yeah, a specific yeah. benchmark I don't remember year. What it is, but it's, it's 2005 or something. I don't know. It's yeah, 2005. So yeah. you need to, by this certain date, by this certain year, you need to have your CO2 levels uh, thirty percent lower than what they your two thousand five levels. So I'm curious if any of these things. I'd have to look into it, I guess. But like, if China's is also kind of set up the same way, where it's like once you reach your peak, then we'll start basing all of your reductions based off that peak year. I really right. am curious to see what that is because wouldn't that just encourage them to have as much CO two levels as possible? Like if they just like increased it by as much as possible by twenty thirty. And then so that their 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 ten percent reduction after that is at that like artificially high level. I really am curious to see if that's right. If that's the case. Well, it might so be. it very it, well might be. I, I'm sure. I'm sure it is. But the, the other thing to keep in mind is a. It doesn't matter what they say anyway. They can change their mind later <laughs> on, right? It doesn't matter. And b if they even if they did decide, even if they were like, you know what, no, well, we will just start you know, reducing our CO2 emissions by 2030. A, we're already past the point of no return, according to all of these people on the left, AOC and Bernie Sanders and John Kerry. It's over. We're dead anyway. Okay, that's number one. Number two, they're probably thinking, well, by 2030, 
most of the Western economies will have totally committed suicide following these policies anyway. Right. So who cares? We'll be the richest people left in the room. So that's all right. We can live with that, right? And notice that they said they're going to reduce it and then be net zero by like some, it's some outrageous year in the future, like 2060 or 2070 or something. It's like, well, yeah, I mean, no, how, why should we believe you? Right. Well, you know, like, why, why should we believe you? You guys are notorious liars. You've been lying about this issue forever. You lie about every other issue, too. Uh, these are the same people that still to this day won't admit that they've got a million people in concentration camps, even though we've got reports from all over the place saying that they do. They're building solar panels. In building some solar panels, <laughs> right. So, yeah, they'll build lots of solar panels. They've got whole us. Probably, and they've got whole cities worth of places that are empty. I mean, this is a, th this whole society is like just a funhouse mirror distortion of like, nah, you know, centrally what a, planned economies. I mean, right, it, it, it really is. But the point is, you can't believe any promises that these people make. And, and so who cares what their commitments are? The point is they're not really going to do it because it makes too much sense for them not to do it. You know what they did want, though? They did demand that the world start providing more funding for the developing world because the developing world, they really need more infrastructure and they need more green energy and blah, 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 blah. Well, guess who does more investing in the development world than anybody else? China. So of the course they want initiative. all these. Exactly. So of course they want that. I mean, so they're all for pushing for changes right now that benefit them, yeah. but they're not going to do anything right now that hurts them. Ugh. So again, do any of these people actually, and they're the biggest CO2 emitters. So all of this is for nothing. Even if I did believe all of the underlying assumptions, it wouldn't matter because China's not going to do it and nothing we do is going to force them to do it. Right. Yeah. Uh, so, so like we were talking about all this stuff, all this background, backroom dealing and all these, uh, different net zero agreements that are being agreed to just on like a corporate level, not even like a government intergovernmental level, like on a corporate level that's happening that actually has real lasting effects and is going to overhaul the way our economy runs, you know, uh, just go back and watch our great reset video too. All of this is happening. And it's just like, wow, these people that are really controlling things that are pulling the strings and all this stuff that's going on, like they are really good at what they do. But then on the other hand of things, uh, it seems like the UN and other government officials or Joe Biden falling asleep. It's like they're also horribly, embarrassingly inept. And my biggest piece of evidence that's just recently come out for this is this awesome UN produced video so good that is it un produced it is un produced okay. it's uh the un that department of well, something they, they stupid. don't even try there's fifty thousand departments at the un so they have a marketing thing that uh, their marketing campaign is don't choose extinction mm. and this is their uh this is their big like cornerstone uh thing Spokes for that person spokes thing <laughs> for that for that campaign mm. so let's let's watch this here we go Oh, his name's Frankie. Oh, that's a little loud. Let me turn this down. Here we go. Frankie the dinosaur has a hum a message for humanity. For those that are just uh, audio only listeners, I'll try to describe a little bit here. We got uh, a UN delegation. Their little boardroom of yeah, they're in the big UN hall thing. Big UN hall. In walks a dinosaur, looking very Jurassic World esque. Yeah, very good CGI, by the way. Yeah, not bad. It's not like Jurassic Park, the original levels of quality, but it's not bad. You okay? You need a minute? Cool. He's walking up to the podium, the dinosaur is. <clears throat> Listen up, people. I know a thing or two about extinction. Do you recognize the voice, Justin? Uh, I know that Jack Black is it's part Jack of Black. this. Let yeah. me tell you. And you'd kind of think this would be obvious. Going extinct is a bad thing. And driving yourselves extinct in 70 million years, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. At least we had an asteroid. What's your excuse? You're headed for a climate disaster, and yet every year governments spend hundreds of billions of public funds on fossil fuel subsidies. 
Imagine if we had spent hundreds of billions per year subsidizing giant meteors. That's what you're doing right now. Think of all the other things you could do with that money. Around the world, people are living in poverty. Don't you think helping them would make more sense than, I don't know, paying for the demise of your entire species? Let me be real like, for a second. The, the music that they're playing yeah. to make this seem so dramatic and like emotionally appealing is a, huge a joke. Opportunity right now. Yeah. As you rebuild your economies and bounce back from this pandemic. Build back this better. Humanity, uh, yes, I thought the same thing. So here's my wild idea. Don't choose extinction. Save your species before it's too late. It's time for you humans to stop making excuses and start making changes. Thank you. <laughs> that guy ovation. in the front thought it was a real dinosaur. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Standing ovation. Standing it's ovation now or never, it says on the screen. It's now or never. Don't, Don't choose, choose extinction. extinction. Right. Com. Yeah, Dot com. we can visit that website too if you we want. We should but... visit that website. You know, I... There are well, several things about where, where do you how do you, where do you want to start? With uh, so just I, I just want to know, like so, there was a boardroom of, uh, you know, the media marketing arm of the U.N. that sat down. They were tossing ideas around and somebody pitched this idea and they decided to run with it. And I want to know why they thought this would be an effective message or video or anything yeah. like who is this convincing? I don't understand it. I remember when, when I, uh, I, when we were talking about this earlier, I said, and I still can't figure it out. I, I don't know who this is designed for. Yeah, right. Like I, I truly don't know who this is designed for. If this, this is obviously not going to persuade, you know, any rational adult, right? <laughs> so like rational adults are out. People who don't believe that we're going to go extinct are out because they're not going to buy this because some stupid CGI dinosaur tells them. So uh, kids, for kids, kids, kids is what we thought. If you're if it, you're sitting there again, pitching this in like this boardroom marketing meeting and you're talking about a talking dinosaur, that to me is just like if this isn't for kids, it's a weird thing. Well, the thing is about the kids, though, is that. um, Kids. It, it, the CGI doesn't look like a kid dinosaur. No, number no, it's one. It's definitely not Barney. It's definitely like Jurassic no, World level. It, it's definitely Jurassic World level. Like if that dinosaur started eating the delegates, <laughs> that would seem not that crazy. Like it looks <laughs> like that could happen. It's very realistic looking. Uh -huh. And then the other part of it is like the, the rhetoric is so over the top. That's that's see, to that, me, that's the most conflicting thing. If this yeah. was like a, a dinosaur that was coming out there and talking about why we need to take climate change seriously or something like that, I would say it's absolutely for kids. But when his like message is we're all going to die, humanity is going to go extinct. That seems like a pretty like loud thing to say to kids. You yeah, <laughs> it's kind of yeah. frightening. A little scary. It, it is than a dinosaur. It is. And the, and the message and maybe that is the point. Maybe that is what they're going for. But if but I mean, think about it, right? So, you know, you got your seven year old and they're at school and or eight year old or nine year old or whatever, and they're showing this video and uh, they uh, are in the car with their parents driving around town and they stop at a gas station. W what are the kids supposed to do? Like, are they going to burst into tears because some dinosaur CGI dinosaur at the UN told them that we're going extinct and that we're all going to die yeah. from, from them using gas, putting gasoline in their car. Right. That is totally insane. If that really is what they're doing, that's, that's well, pretty it's, horrible. It's Jack black, who is the voice of Kung Fu Panda, if I'm not mistaken. So like kids would probably recognize his voice just from his voice acting. You that's know? a good point. I mean, I, I can't, I, I guess, he doesn't only do kid stuff, though, which is, again, another one of those reasons why he's like one of those people who I guess it, it could go either way. Like this video could go either way. Right. And maybe they're trying to appeal to everybody. Maybe that's the goal. I don't know. But it's, it's just it's, they're, they're appealing to adults with like very limited uh, brain capacity. This right. is this is made for the AOCs of the world. <laughs> yeah, exactly. She was the one that was that stood up and clapped. At the <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean, it's just so. It's just so stupid. It, it's it's so stupid on so many levels. But I will say this from just a an extinction perspective, right? Like we're just going to look at this at extinction. Can somebody show me 
show me someone mm -hmm. the scientific report that says that humanity is about to go extinct from climate change That's show a... me the scientific report that does not exist right there's not a there is not one scientific that, report that's a very that says we're gonna thing. go extinct the, 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 so this plays into a, a concept that i hate so much which is just like this very broad brush painting uh that yep. comes from and I'll, I'll you know i'll say that a lot of it comes from like the soundbite media and all of that where it's just like they have that meme, the the ninety seven percent of scientists agree, right? And we've talked about this a million times. That like that 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 number is derived from a couple of different very flawed studies. But the one that I like to talk about most is just like that question that they ask scientists: two questions. One, is there warming happening? And two, do do humans play a role in it? Right? And like generally speaking, even people on our side of the aisle will say yes to both of those things. So if the Heartland Institute climate experts people are included in your 97%, you know, whatever, then the questions that are being asked are pretty irrelevant, right? Yeah. So they have this meme, 97% of scientists agree, whatever. And then they apply it to everything, not just those two questions, but to whether or not we need solar panels or whether or not we need to overinvest in electric cars or whether or not humanity is going extinct you know it's just this concept that everyone agrees that this is the reality of the situation yeah. and it's not like you said no. there are no real scientists out there saying that we are all going to be dead uh due to extinct you know we're not, all going to be extinct due to climate change in the not next, that i'm aware of years not that i'm aware of and there's certainly not uh, a consensus around that which seems to be <laughs> no. their like whole measuring stick for everything's got to be based on a consensus well if it's based on a consensus nobody agrees with that and then to kind of flip it on its head a little bit there actually are climate alarmists some who believe that humanity might go extinct the alarmists, not scientists, sure. who think humanity might go extinct, but who don't think that solar panels and windmills are going <laughs> to save us. And so the the tent is so complicated. Right. And they, you're right. They try to dumb it down and simplify it and say, well, everyone just agrees. And we're yeah. going to go you're extinct. And we're all going to die. And it's windmills and solar panels all the way. And it's like, no one, I, actually, you cannot find a consensus that agrees on any of these things yeah, anything that the stupid that this dinosaur. dinosaur is saying. Like, literally <laughs> you nothing. Got, you got it right before I did. Yeah, nothing. Yeah. Like, this this dinosaur is a moron. Yeah, and, and when we when we do an energy-centric episode, we'll get into this a little bit more. But the, the person just, that you're referring to that's worried about, like, climate change killing us all but knows that wind and solar aren't going to stop that from happening is Michael Moore. Michael Moore's uh, uh, executive produced Planet of the Humans. We'll talk about that in length because we think that it's a very important and, kind and of he milestone. Includes, and he includes numerous other people on the left in that video who, uh, where he he doesn't. I mean, Jeff Gibbs is the director of it, but that the the that documentary includes many people who don't agree with at least some aspect of what is considered the standard talking point about climate change and climate alarmism and all this other stuff. And their solution in that movie basically is we need less people. That's yeah, their they, solution. They tiptoe around the idea of population control, but we'll get into that in a yeah, different but the, episode. But the point the point is. The other thing, the, in addition to all of that, the other thing that really bothers me about this dinosaur is that there's no, it's just a simple, well, you're either for extinction and fossil fuels, or you're against fossil fuels and against extinction. Right. And that's it. That's Even I'm though all of their p own plans require fossil fuels to continue to exist because you cannot, it is literally impossible to run the world on windmills and solar panels without having some kind of stable form of electricity generation backing it up caused mostly, typically, depending on where you are in the world, I guess it varies, but it's gotta either be nuclear or it's gotta be uh, fossil fuels. That's it. There's uh, no other way to do it. That sounds like an excuse to use this dinosaur's words. Uh, so I'm going to go to their website. I'm going to go to their website. Um, and there are the excuses. Now, I did look through this a little bit. This isn't like pre-planned or anything, but I did kind of peruse the excuses a little bit here. But uh, oh, can I not even scroll on this? What the heck? Oh, here we go. All right. Nope, I can't. 
Oh, here we go. Okay. <laughs> we need fossil fuels for our economy. That's what you just said, basically. Let's see what they say. Fossil fuels don't cure our economy. They actually hurt it in more ways than one by taking billions of taxpayer dollars to support and causing costly destruction of our planet, Justin. So your concern that we need fossil fuels is just an excuse. A fossil fuels. Just look at that first sentence. <laughs> Fossil fuels don't cure our global economy. What does that even mean? <laughs> cure it? Cure it? How? I don't what, know. What, what, the problem is not the global economy. The problem is climate change, I thought, right? Isn't that the problem you're trying to solve? You're not trying to cure the problem of the global economy. Your problem is with climate change that you're saying is a, is a result of the global economy. It doesn't even make sense, that sentence. Doesn't Here, even wait. Make sense. Here, this is also kind of uh, related to your statement that you just made. I've heard renewables aren't reliable or affordable. Fossil fuels are finite, like a limited edition energy source, but not in a good way. Because <laughs> <laughs> limited editions are good, so they had to clarify yeah, that. Yeah, why would they even use that then? <laughs> And that's exactly why they're not as reliable as endless energy sources like renewables. Oh, that really? Is the the biggest <laughs> like they that is that like is the, so disingenuous. It's so disingenuous. It's so disingenuous. Do we have unlimited rare earth metals to dig out of the ground to <laughs> yeah. build the solar panels and windmills? Make infinite solar panels. We and can make mills. infinite solar panels and windmills. <laughs> See, this is the th like, that is so incredibly frustrating. Also, when you read the idea stuff that, like that, yeah, fossil. I mean, we don't have to get into a whole economics lesson here, but fossil fuels are finite. Yeah, so as the amount of fossil mm -hmm. fuels decreases, then the price to extract those or use those will increase. Mm -hmm. So we will j probably never actually run out of fossil fuels, but the last gallon of gasoline will be so expensive that it'll be in a museum because but, nobody but will use it. That, that's that's <laughs> so. true. That is 100% true, and it's basic economics. But I, but I will say, I, I mean, think, think about this. The idea that fossil fuels are finite and that is somehow comparable to us saying that windmills and solar panels aren't reliable. Let, let's make this very clear. When they say that fossil fuels are finite, they mean it could run out in a thousand years. Yeah. When I say that windmills and solar panels aren't reliable, I mean that literally next week there could be a blackout where all energy, if we were running purely on that, no one has power for a whole week yes. because we've got some giant storm somewhere that, that you know, the sun isn't yeah. shining. And so what are we supposed to do? Like, yeah. that's what I'm talking right. about. Yeah, like like what happened <laughs> you know, in Texas right. earlier this year. You, you know, you're, like You're trying to tell me that like a problem that could happen right this minute is the same as something that is a problem a thousand years from now? Yeah. There's, Give there's, me a break. When we do our energy-centric episode, Gosh. I'll just tease this right now. There wow. are articles, like New York Times articles, uh, that talk about how we, we have to brace for impact to this, cup, this upcoming winter because people are going to run out of energy and probably freeze to death. This, and we have to make sure that green energy doesn't take its uh, fair share of the blame. Right, like exactly. They are preparing for people to freeze to death because of how unreliable and unaffordable uh, renewable energy is. And, and again, we cannot reiterate this enough. It is not renewable energy. You have, it does not last the wind and the sun will exist forever. Okay. I get that. That is renewable, but the, but you, the wind and sun are not the things actually producing the energy. You have to have tools to harness the wind and the sun and yeah. those things have to be built using finite resources yeah, guess what all resources are finite essentially all resources that we use to create energy are involve finite resources yeah so to use that as your primary argument is is so outrageous i, I can't even believe that they're yeah, trying and that and again we'll do a whole energy episode but Gosh. yeah it's just like uh, wind, uh, the wind turbines, uh, they only last like 20 years because they start developing these little micro cracks in the blades and you can't recycle them. So you just have to bury them and they're the size of like whales. So you have these pictures of just these <laughs> landfills that just have endless amounts of how these many, turbines. How many turbines 
would we bury in the ground over the next thousand years? <laughs> right? Before we run out of Before fossil fuels. Before we run fuels. out of fossil fuels. How many? And then, How many? And then and then the uh the solar panels, those are built with uh rare earth materials like lead and cadmium and all of the stuff that could be toxic if it seeps into the groundwater. So when these things run out, uh or uh, you know, because they they degrade over time and they only last about 20 years or so, and they have to be recycled, they can't be recycled, they have to be dis- disposed of properly uh they they um they can't just be thrown into a landfill like i no. said if they break all that stuff seeps into the groundwater so they almost have to be dealt like they're toxic waste yeah and california would, is having to grapple with that but right. again it we will, can get all this yeah in, we, we, we will get into the details deeper, of but, all of this in the future because apparently we're very passionate about it that, but yeah what, no doubt but, the but there's la- two other things yeah go there's ahead. two other things about this dinosaur video that i have to to reference uh one of them is another thing that I constantly complain about, which is the only looking at one side of the ledger, okay? So this is like uh, fossil fuels are leading to our extinction. Like, really? That's all they're doing? They're only leading to our extinction? They're not helping everybody stay warm, uh, you know, during the winter and stay cool during the summer? They're not powering our, like, civilized society? They have not taken us from, like, the pre-industrial, like, humans to where we are now like all of that could just be wiped away you're not going to look at that you're only going to look at like its potential climate change impacts like i despise that so this analogy and i'm i'm talking i'm taking a dinosaur's uh, rhetoric a little bit too seriously <laughs> talking dinosaur's rhetoric rhetoric a little too seriously here i know but just the idea that like it's analogous to the idea that we're uh that we're like subsidizing asteroids like they're coming to crash and kill us like they're incomparable so i i despise that and then the last thing which is just like the they they reference like hundreds of millions of dollars in subsidies to fossil fuels and all of that uh great cancel it i don't care I, i'm yeah. not in favor of subsidies nope. at all period but i will say that it is nuanced uh and you do look into it and it's like some of it is like um you know these these like companies that do exploration for fossil fuels could like write off certain expenses or something like that, which totals up to like, I don't know, hundreds of millions of dollars. And there's also like, um, I think this is also included in, in subsidies where um, like families get certain amount of, um, I don't know, like uh, tax incentives or some type of tax breaks or something like that in terms of their energy usage or something like that. That's all rolled into fossil fuel subsidies as well. Right. And like, so, you know, but even, even if you're to take away the nuance, fine, take away the subsidies. I don't care. Let these things compete against each other, but you will, you you do know that wind and solar get way more subsidies (laughs) than fossil fuels. Also, right. The wind and solar get way more subsidies. And the other thing is, The reason those subsidies went into place, I guarantee it, I guarantee it. The reason those subsidies went into place was either because one, the subsidies were designed to help poorer people pay for energy in some fashion. They're trying to make it more affordable for poorer people. Okay. So they're bringing the cost down to help poor people. That's one reason why, or, and, or they're trying to protect jobs for some particular industry in a particular place or whatever. So it's either about trying to protect jobs or to protect poor people. That's prob almost certainly the vast majority of the subsidies are in some way related to one or both of those things. Sure. And so the idea that it's just like, oh yeah, we're just helping the greedy fossil fuel companies get richer and richer and richer. It's like, that's not really what's going on here because the fossil fuel companies can still charge the same amount of money. Maybe energy costs go up, but it's the lower income people that are suffering the most from that. So, so, so we have a couple of minutes, but I want to go back to this question though, because like I said, backroom dealings are able to move the world in certain directions with uh, the stuff that they're doing. But then they also make this terrible and embarrassing Jack Black voice talking dinosaur video. So what is going on here? Uh, can you make a case that this is like intentional in some way that they're kind of underselling their ability to like you and me oh, when no they way. put out a video like this no way or or is this like the revealing of a little bit of a flaw you know like are they are they actually bad at what they do 
they're just so powerful that they're able to do some of these things. That is 100% it, I think. I mm. think that really, at the end of the day, when you look at so many of the stupid decisions that they make um, on the left, they make lots and lots of real... I'm not saying that the people on the right don't, but the people on the left make a ton of absolutely moronic decisions. And I don't mean in terms of the effects. I just mean like politically, just the way it looks, the way it sounds, just in terms of marketing, objectively stupid decisions. And they do it all the time. And the only reason they get away with it is because the the, the media and the institutions of society will back them and cover them always, no matter what, anyway. And so this stupid dinosaur video comes out and they say all these ludicrous things in it and the media will either just ignore it or talk about it in glowing terms. And that's pretty much it. And, but if this was a Donald Trump video and Donald Trump produced a video with a talking, you know, animal that comes out and says that, you know, America is going to fall apart because of, uh, you know, illegal immigrants. And here's why we're not going to be able to survive because of illegal immigration. Then that's all the media would be talking about. No doubt. They would be talking about it nonstop. And if it was as ludicrous as this in terms of the presentation of it yeah. and the broad sweeping uh, comments in it, like... If, immig if illegal immigration is allowed, America's gonna collapse into fire and dust within the next 20 years. If that was really the video, that, that they would obs be obsessively talking about, yeah. about that. They'd be voiced by the MyPillow guy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so, I mean, like the idea that, the, the idea that, you know, these guys are just, it, it's just one of these things where they're like the spoiled rich kid who is a single child, who grew up in a house that's been told their entire lives that they're special and they're great and here's all the money you could ever want. You can go anywhere you want to college and we'll pay for everything and everything is great. The kid's never been told no ever in their lives. Right. And so then they grow up to become total jerks and horrible people and dysfunctional human beings, right? With drug addictions, like, I don't know, Hunter Biden or something like that. And... They, they're like this totally dysfunctional people. And you wonder why it's because they grew up in this environment that fostered this, this sentiment that developed into this crazy mindset that they have. Well, yeah. that is exactly the situation with these kinds of people. They've been told their whole lives. They're great. They're special. They're saving the world. Everything they do is great. They're never going to get trashed the same way other people get trashed for it. And so they do super crazy, stupid, obviously dumb things and there's no repercussions for it. So, yeah, I I, I don't know. I, I feel like there could be an argument made on the other direction that this is this is just like an intentional thing, like and just one bit. And we're already kind of going long. So this will just be my kind of my final statement on the matter. But like, uh, you know, we talk about the U the U.N. All right. This isn't even the way that you and I talk about it, but people on the right side of the aisle generally talk about the UN as just like, oh, they're just like, it's all for show. It's like ceremonial. They don't they don't have any real power. It's like the, the UN. And it's just like you say this. Are you saying this because you want them to have more power or or not? And I almost wonder if it's like it works the UN's advantage to kind of come off as just like, oh, no, no, don't take us seriously. Like, don't worry about us. Like, no, you're shaking your head, but no way. No way. I, want, these, I want the people that are listening to this to sound these, off in the these comments. People are look okay. Last e example, just to put an exclamation point on this. I'll give you the last word, and then we're gonna wrap it up. Joe Biden, very recently, just thought announced, or at least the report is that the Biden administration is working on a deal that will pay. It wasn't an announcement. It's working on a deal quietly that would give. People who came to America illegally, $450,000 per person, purely because they came here illegally and were separated from the people they claim to be their children, but we can't actually verify necessarily to be their children. And now we're going to pay them $450,000. Now, even per person. So some of these people are going to million dollars, some of these families. Now, even if you think that immigrants should just be able to flood across the border by the millions and millions and millions with no repercussions, even if you believe that. You have to acknowledge that politically, this is beyond stupid. This is just the dumbest political move you could possibly imagine. And yet, they're doing it anyway. Yeah. 
And yeah. why? Everyone who thinks this is a good idea is voting for him anyway. So why why would he do this politically? Because they are all in this warped universe where everything they do is the right thing and anyone who criticizes them is uh, a I, Donald Trump racist, yeah, hating, that's... horrible person. And so it doesn't matter, right? They can do whatever they want. Yeah. All right. Well, I want people to, uh, to, to sound off on this in the comments and leave what you think. Are they Are they actually horribly inept and you know that could actually be used as some type of uh, a flaw in the armor that uh, can help take down this thing or is this all part of their plan and they actually know the ins and outs of all the terrible stupid stuff that they do and it's all part of the plan but uh we're already long so we're gonna call it quits on this episode of justin and donald save america like i said i am donald this is justin if you like our show you can really help us out especially in these early days just by leaving a comment liking it sharing it subscribing to our channel leaving a review any of those things will really really help uh get this content in front of the eyes of more people if you want to see more content and stuff produced by uh by us and the stopping socialism project and all of that you can go to stoppingsocialism.com we also have uh, stopping socialism tv on youtube if you're not a subscriber to that you definitely should be um and you know you can find us across social media as well just look up stopping socialism or justin and donald save america justin where can the fine people find you at justin t haskins on facebook socialist twitter getter parlor you love and getter everything i actually really i it's very enjoyable yes <laughs> all right thank you all for tuning in and we will talk to you next week <laughs>